thermals. Um, by far the most popular source of lift for most uh, sailplane pilots. The picture pretty much explains it. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's how thermals form. I won't spend too much time on this as this is already very long. Uh, bubble thermals, um, what happens is the um, land here um, heats faster than the land around it, you know, like a regular thermal, but what happens is it heats, 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 and then there's this bubble rising, you have this cold air rushing in, you know, this air rising, rising, this cold air rushing in, and the, the cold air that rushes in kills the, and it it like kills all the new hot air and so you get this bubble that's like cut off and then it the bubble keeps rising and but and cooling and stuff but the bubble keeps rising but there is no more hot air under it like you'll see in the next one uh, the uh, column thermal but this um this, the bubble thermal isn't really that good for soaring as you can see in the picture below um, yeah, and it's also not quite as common as the column. Typically, bubble thermals also will not have a cloud. Almost always will not have a cloud. Okay, the column or plume model. Uh, this is by far the simplest and most common type of thermal. Thermals are different, but um, this is a good model to follow. You have the cold air rushing into a place. The warmer, the colder gets rapidly heated. Um, you have this rising air. You have a cumulus cloud, not always, only if um, thermal gets to the condensation level. If it does get to the condensation level and there is a cloud, the thermal will get capped. There will be no more lift. Almost always. There are exceptions to that. Um, this is the not-so-good lift and um, sometimes turbulent lift. Uh, and this is sink. Okay, here in this cross section, you can see the very, um, the, the most intense lift, not necessarily turbulent, just the fastest lift. Uh, typically, it actually isn't turbulent. Usually, it is rather smooth. Um, less intense lift, um, moderate lift, uh, oftentimes turbulent. This is sink. Okay, cloud streets. This is a very complex subject on how these form, and honestly there hasn't been very much observation in the air about how these form, but we do have a general good idea of how these form. What happens is you have um, upper wind that is moving faster and often in a perpendicular di direction, although it has happened with um, it being in the same or opposite direction. Um, you get this roll, that is right here, you get this roll. And then what happens is you have these um, cumulus clouds. Usually, as I've said before, in thermals, they are not always there. But um, it, it is very hard to find um, a, uh, a cloud street if they do not have these little cumulus clouds here. And what happens is you have this roll here. Um, and you have rising air, sinking air, rising air. Uh, in the rising air, there's a cumulus cloud, usually. In the sinking air, there will never be a cloud because um, all the air is sinking and uh, therefore all the water is evaporating. Also, I'll, I'll go back here. Here you can see the cap, the inversion cap, um, the roll. It's more of a 2D view and the cumulus clouds. Alright, ridge lift. Um, another very common source of lift if you live near a mountain range. Um, you have a ridge, you have wind that is within about 30 degrees, 30 to 45 degrees, um, the numbers vary. The more perpendicular it is to the uh, mountain, the, the stronger, or um, sorry, the, mo the more efficient the wind will be. Um, the stronger the wind, the stronger the lift, though. Um, and right there is is the main bubble of lift. Um, ridge lift can extend up to three times the height of the uh, the mass that's blocking the air. Although typically it's a little less than that. 
more, uh, sometimes more in the range of 2 to 1, or 2.5 to 1. Alright, here's a, a smooth ridge lift. You see the best lift is, is quite close, but it does extend further up. You have this air, and here it ends up being smooth. Um, as I said, the, the more wind you have, and the more perpendicular it is to the mountain, um, the better ridge lift day you're going to have. Alright, uh, when you have a near vertical ridge, uh, you're going to have this eddy, and these eddies can spin up and pretty much slam people right into the mountain. Um, it's happened to sail planes, and, and it's happened to uh, single engine planes. Uh, typically these aren't too intense, but um, for instance, if the uh, if it's a uh, very low density um, day, and for instance, there's a single engine airplane that on that day can only climb 300 feet per minute, that can totally slam them into a mountain. Okay, here you can see um, what bowls do to lift, and um, how that happens, 3D effect. Alright, airflow over a typical peak. Um, usually this doesn't happen, but it's a good model to follow. This is generally what ridge lift is, although there are a lot more quirks to it. Okay, um, airflow over a plateau, you'll still have that eddy right here, because this is near vertical. Um, but yeah, you'll have another eddy, eddy here that, um, you know, can slam you right down as well. Um, if you have a multiple peaks, and if they're staggered, um, each little... A uh, hole is going to have its own eddy, you know, which which can be violent. Typically, if you have any sort of uh, depression in a mountain, you you will have an eddy on the leeward side, especially. Okay, um, mountain or lee wave lift. This is the rarer of the three main lift types of lift uh, used by sailplane pilots, um, also referred to as turbulence by most powered airplane pilots, uh, less uh, lee wave lift generally, or almost always, good wave lift occurs during stable air conditions. That means high pressure. Also, you want the wind to increase with altitude. Um, here, you uh, typically will have lenticular clouds, that, and they'll, they'll be uh, standing. They will not move. They will be in the exact same spot. Uh, throughout the uh, throughout their lifespan, um, occasionally you'll have this cap cloud over the peak of the mountain. Not always. Um, so this uh, lee wave lift can often extend all the way to the tropopause, and uh, I'll discuss um, how it gets into the stratosphere later on. But um, generally, it, it maxes out somewhere at the tropopause or below the tropopause. Um, rotors. These are very dangerous. These have been known for ripping apart, and I mean literally ripping apart airplanes, um, all the way from little single-engine Cessna sailplanes all the way to commercial 747 Boeing jets. Um, and their effect can be felt all the way down to the ground. That is, um, literally all the way down to the ground. Um, but however, they are the most intense here. And they have caused several accidents for airplanes that were taking off because of wind shear, which is the, uh, the rapid changing of speed or direction of, of uh, wind. And you have this lee wave. And I'll talk about how the wave actually forms in a second. Wave oscillation is actually how um, the waves keep going. So what happens is the uh, air goes down, um, but it wants to reach equilibrium, at the temperature that it actually is. So um, what happens is the air uh, goes up then. It goes up, 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 up. It has so much momentum that it goes past um, equilibrium and it keeps going up, and then finally it runs out of momentum, starts going down, gains momentum, and then goes back up, and that's where you get the wave. Um, the only reason it's in a wave and not strictly up and down, which it would be, um, is the wind. Um, so just think about it as a spring, and then you um, 
the rhythm just keeps going. It's like if your uh, spring is oscillating and you're moving it, and that's the pattern it's making in the air. Okay, um, destructive interference is when, for instance, you have a wave, and then you have another peak that is um, not uh, a wavelength, a certain number of wavelengths away. Um, for instance, right here you have one and a half wavelengths, and that effectively flattens out the wave. However, um, the topography oftentimes can work in your favor with constructive interference. If it is a certain number of wavelengths exactly away, then what will happen, or it's called in phase, um, it will actually amplify. Okay, I'll briefly talk about the Perlin Project. The Perlin Project is um, a group of people who, um, after their first mission, called Perlin-1, soared to um, about 52,000 feet and um, achieved the record for um, altitude for the highest sailplane flight in history. And using stratospheric waves, which I'll explain, and they also, they, they want to go higher. Now they want to go to 90,000 feet using these stratospheric waves. Um, and for that, they're going to actually develop a special, a special um, carbon fiber pressurized sailplane um, and go higher than any winged aircraft has ever gone, ever. That in includes jet aircraft. Okay, here's how these stratospheric waves actually work. Um, in something called the um, polar vortex, which is a, a, um, a high-pressure zone uh, at both poles, um, they're specifically going to use the southern pole because it's uh, uh, faster and more and uh, larger. Um, and it's, it's a very high-altitude jet stream. And what that will do, instead of these winds bottoming out right here and getting smoother, they're going to keep getting faster. Uh, these winds uh, in the polar vortex go upwards of 200 knots. And they're going to use those to keep riding these waves up and up and up. And their goal is to get to 90,000 feet and um, they are optimistic of actually exceeding that goal by quite a bit, given their um, new aircraft. 